Davidson is hiring to do this project, and we have the option or the opportunity to buy into it. If you look on near the bottom of that screen, the estimate by stakeholder, we obviously are the city of Auburn, and you'll notice that we are the, the, the larger portion of that, uh, of the stakeholders, the, the largest outlay of, of money. That's mostly because Lewiston is almost done. They've been doing this over the last three years through their CIP, and they are now just tidying up loose ends to pull things forward. <coughs> they own most of their fiber now, and the water district only has three sites that they're really concerned about, so their chunk isn't very big. We are looking at doing 11 sites, adding it into this backbone that would run through the city plenty of plenty of uh, bandwidth uh, we can then light it at whatever speeds we want we will own that fiber we can do with it as we will and it is significantly over capacity for what we currently have now and while I don't think that we're adding a lot of new municipal buildings this gives us a, a opportunity to to do things a little bit differently and it gives us a chance if we decide to that we could then sublease that out to somebody else or we could just donate that capacity to someone else making their job easier. There, there's the map which shows the uh, most of the, the, the run. Paul? That big chunk of yellow, that is the backbone that, that this Paul? project, yes. I'm sorry, just to interrupt. Could you just speak a little bit closer to the microphone? Sure. No. Thank you. The microphone's pushing me along. I can't see all of you when I'm talking into that one. Okay. <laughs> Plus, I know Brian's over there riding levels in the other room, and he's probably adjusting desperately to keep me on. So what we would want to do is just, without waiting five years, we have an opportunity to join into a project that's already going to happen, and we just want to jump into that and just say, yep, we are committing. We are going to do our portion of it and just get it done and out of the way. And that's sort of the brief overview of it. Obviously, I'm happy to answer any questions. And if you need any clarification, we'll clarify what I can now. And if not, I'll get back to you with, or with more detailed answers. Paul, and what's the annual? I'll get. Sorry, what's the annual expenditure right now for lease? Uh, we spend about two thousand dollars a month, so twenty-four twenty-four k. I would also add um, that I think one of the things that's unique about this particular opportunity is um, our costs right now are extremely uh, low, well below market. Um, and when um, First Light originally uh, took over our contract, one of the things that they articulated and kind of explored was um, mark or moving us to market rate, which would be about, correct me if I'm wrong, five to six times more expensive than what we're currently paying. Um, so one of the things that's um, you know uh, appealing about this particular prospect is uh, obviously the opportunity to control those costs moving forward. Um, and as Paul articulated, um, kind of maximizing economy of scale at the current moment, um, but also um, since this network, um, as you can see, kind of uh, bobs and weaves throughout significant portions of the city um, and is going to be um, underutilized in terms of the city's needs and capacities. Um, there is that opportunity to then partner with private sector um, to start looking at last mile uh, coverage for a lot of areas right now that um, may not necessarily have um, some of the speeds that we've deemed uh, you know, necessary for school work, for home businesses, um, the like. And so um, this also kind of folds into that broader access uh, conversation as well. Go ahead, Councilor Rosalina, you have a question? Uh, um, that was the answer to my question. I was curious. I, I saw that the um, Vincent apartments are on there that they would be connected, and that's a private spot. So would it be able, would individuals be able to connect to this? N not individual apartments or residents there. That would be another project altogether. What we're actually picking up in Vincent Square is the electronic signboard that's out in right. front there. We but have I mean a cabinet next to Raleigh's parking lot that we have. But fiber. at some point, this could be used yes. by individuals. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That was without, my question. Without compromising the security or the integrity yes. of the fiber? Fi fiber is wicked secure. Um, it's really hard to steal data over fiber. It's the most secure way to move data. It's a wire. It's, it's not. A, it's, it's a, a skinny, a, a, tiny a, little hair length 
it's a, a bundle. Tube, it's a glass tube. Right, right where it has <laughs> optical switch on either end right. that shoots lasers across it. So yep. it'll have a bundle of, say, 50 or 100 strands. 144. Okay, yeah, 144 <laughs> strands. And then you're going to need to terminate that at all these different places right. with optical switches of some sort. Are we going to reuse all the, the routers and switches and stuff that are currently... Uh, Are most we of leasing the, those from First most Light? Of the, no, we own those. Okay. Mo so we do all the lighting. We, all we lease is the fiber itself. Um, in each of the locations that are identified as City of Auburn, we already have that equipment there. We would probably upgrade some of that equipment over time because some of those switches are you know, 10 and 12 years yeah. old at, at this point. So there will be some replacement of those, but that would be built part of our regular annual, you know, annual budget appropriation, not part of this project. What we do is if we were going to let people have access to that, we'd pick strands out right. of that. Exactly. And, and create and connect that to a circuit of some sort that was completely separate from the city. Right. So it wouldn't have anything to do with it. I think I used to do this for a living, didn't you? <laughs> do this for a living, yeah. I remember that. <laughs> um, so is there any other questions? Would this tie in with the school department at all, or do they have their own fiber network? They have their own fiber network, and this is much less of a priority for them because they have E-rate reimbursement for mm -hmm. their fiber. So they're much not they're not as motivated as we are to control that cost. Um, this project, the way it's described here, does not include the school department, but that's certainly in the boy eight eight to eighteen months that this is going to take. There will certainly be an opportunity to fold them into it if they if they desire that. But that would be a very different project. Councilor Boss? What's the cost saving opportunity for us to do this project now with the city of Lewiston? Say if we forgo this this year, we decide we don't want to do it, but in two years we say, shoot, we should have done this. <laughs> How much more will it cost, regardless of the, m m the market rate separate? What's the savings that we're going to be receiving by partnering with the city of Lewiston? A lot of that's in the capacity. So we're doing 144 mm -hmm. strands of fiber in that, in that yellow uh, backbone that's going to run through it. The schools, if we didn't do that or if we don't partner with them, they will do similar things but only going to their sites. So they really only need to go to the, the Auburn Water District building up the hill and then the, up to the lake. Um, and that's all that they would do. So we would then be on the hook for all of the rest of that. And I don't think that would be the, the 246K that, that's here. We would be basically starting this project. If you look at the the bottom number on that sheet is five hundred thousand, and I think we would be looking at most of that if we were doing it without. Okay, that. thank you. So the the labor is what's right. The size of this, you're talking the size of the cable. Yes. So it's a, how much per foot for forty four strands versus one hundred forty four, whatever. I forget what the breakdown is. And, and the ca the cable itself would be a very small part of. Right. of this cost. Mostly you're paying to, for a, somebody to go up on a truck and, and mount it to a pole or pull it through a, a conduit in a That's a what I'm thinking. The labor is the, the, the cost. Labor is the it's, not the, it's not that much more to get a 256 strand right. versus a 144. Yep, exactly. Would, would mean it be, so probably in the labor, not duplicating the labor, I would guess. Right. So in your logic, you see the labor number. So, so if you like this project, you want to move forward with this project, we can bring this back before you the next meeting. We would recommend our proposal. This, just so you know, I'm, this is going to be part of the update later on too, but the opportunity meds, this was part of it. It was on the, as a top tier priority, uh, especially considering the ROI, um, and which is obviously good displacement over the next X amount of years, depending on what that money flow is. So if there's general consensus on this. I just had one quick question to what Councilor Mills was talking about. Is there any benefit to adding more strands now to this backbone, or is this going to be enough bandwidth? Look, hypothetically, if we're going to pay to do this, I want fiber at my house. I would like fiber at Councilor Mills. You know what I mean? Like, eventually, I would like to get there. If we're going to pay for the labor, is it worth putting in beefier uh, fiber network than what we're looking at right now? Probably not, okay. because if we were going to your house through fiber, it wouldn't be using up two strands of this fiber to go from your house right. back to the 
the first light or whoever the provider was going to be. There would be a hub that would connect back and then your house would be fiber connected to that hub or through a series of hubs. Um, so, th so that backbone won't be using your specific fiber. There would be another feed off of that. Okay, and the backbone will be future proof for quite some time. That, that's what I'm asking. Yes. Is there going to be enough there for 10, 20 there, years? Th from that's now? a lot. And okay. if, if you've been watching over the last four or five years, the speeds that we're moving data through fiber is, it's a, I, I forget what right. it's called from maths, but it's not a linear scale. It's algorithmic. You know, it, uh, the fiber is, has unlimited, one strand has really unlimited things. So right. you would take this loop and let's say you want it to go off another, you would take one strand connect it, and then you could put another 144 off of that out of a little switch that would then connect that whole next spur. Perfect. If I'm not mistaken. A process question quickly. So you mentioned ARPA funds. I think this is an excellent use of ARPA funding, particularly because we're leveraging other funds coming in. Mm -hmm. How are we going to look at all of the ARPA projects that are on the docket so that we can compare them to one another? Great question. Is that good? Yeah. Thank you. If you have... Oh. Make a difference to, to string them. Uh, I mean, is it preferable to have them be underground just because of weather? It, yes, but you would need to budget a whole lot more money. <laughs> That's what I thought. I was just curious. Um, it is. It is. Exponentially. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I don't want to think. I mean, wherever we can, this is going to, like between here and the county building, for example, we know we have a path yeah. underground, so that's one that would be underground. Most of this is going to be aerial, at least to the poles. Where it goes from there, um, <laughs> um, at Vincent Square, somebody had asked about that. That went underground. Uh, we go into that cabinet underground, and we go from that cabinet to the sign underground, and we would presumably go into that Vincent Square building underground if that's what we were going to do, if that was what the project led to. Um, but a lot of this is going to be on, on the poles. And a big advantage to Lewis of partnering, with, partnering with us on this is that we have access to those poles. They would have to then negotiate with CMP or whoever to, to put any of their stuff on poles. So, so I think we, we help have, them, they help us. So I think we have consensus. Uh, that this will come probably in November 15th meeting as an order appropriating from ARPA funds. Um, we can obviously have more debate there as things come up. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wasn't the lightsaber just one big fiber optic, too? Mm, beautiful. That's a movie, sir. That's not That's real. <laughs> Don't say it's not real <laughs> by your tongue. Some sort of a laser thing. So, 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 laser. Well, that'll be a future workshop discussion item. Uh, next on the agenda, uh, we are, where is, hold on. Speaking of technology, uh, Build Auburn Back Program. Councillor Walker, Councillor Carrier wanted this as a workshop item uh, to discuss, and this is, um, in reference back to the ARPA project, Councillor Boss, you weren't here, but the ARPA project brought forth uh, by myself during communications for consideration. Uh, manager has it up on the screen. Did you want to explain a little bit, or do you want me to run with that? Oh, go Councilor ahead, Carrier? Just highlights, and I'll turn it over to Councillor Carrier, Councillor Walker, to discuss to your workshop request. Basically, this is a grant, not a loan, for any small business in Auburn under 50 employees or 50 or lower, less employees, for every full-time employee that they hire, more than 32 hours a week, trying to go off federal um, standards with regards to the Affordable Care Act as definition of full-time versus part-time. Um, effective October 1, running till exhausted, or March 1st. Um, it can be combined with other city federal grant or loan programs. Budget would be $450,000 plus $50,000 for administration, marketing, and communication. And the employee must uh, remain employed at a minimum of 32 hours per week by the employer for at least 60 days. Got to be an Auburn business of good standing as well, which basically means you don't own tax dollars or outstanding you know, fines, permit problems, and so forth. Okay. So that's it. Obviously, it's up on the screen. Turn over to Councilor Carrier, Councilor Walker to ask questions or discuss. 
Is that more than one employee? Uh, we, I'm sorry, we have it capped at no more than two employees per business. Okay, the reason that we wanted to see it here tonight is uh, uh, we're not sure of all the facts that they went through when they were working on it, but uh, I had heard that it was going to be parked for a while, and uh, I, I didn't feel that we should take the time to park it without knowing all the information of why it's being parked, because uh, in some cases, these grants are very important, and other times, maybe we do park them. But we wanted to hear the reasons for parking it, if that if that's true. Who, I, I can give an update. I'll say, who's Our parking it? Yeah, I was, was unable to attend the meeting. Oh. Had, which is ultimately why we fight with then for him to bring this back at our meeting did bring that back in knowing that so i think um a couple of reasons one there had been a discussion and i think it was um a city manager with um the uh, LA um, business community that was not sold on it. Is that no, incorrect? Not, not this, not sold on programs that we would bring before them that would require application to apply. For. Okay. That they, they would have to go through. Right, and this so is, that's, would be one of those. Yeah, it wasn't necessarily this program. It was okay. just any, the, the pro business any funding right. that's coming to them, they have to apply for after going through P. Yeah, and that there is, that there will be further funding coming from the federal government and the state government to help underwrite um, businesses and support them. Now, it's a different kind of funding. The mayor mentioned that some of those are going to be uh, paying off grants that were given to people. Um, but I just felt that to push this forward now, when it does sound like there's not the appetite from the business community to go through another loan program that has to take it's a pretty short period of time. Correction, I'm sorry, just point of correction. This is not a loan, it's a grant. And I think we need to quantify, because I've heard from a half a dozen businesses that really, I'm like, yeah, I could hire two people. So I think it's, and that's where the, I think that's where when we put up in here the communication part and yeah. marketing, Wait, I think that's so gonna be important. Could they hire two, they need $8,000 to hire two people? They so, can ask for. Well, no, so that's what I'm just. That's what I'm asking. Is right. eight thousand dollars? If they could hire the people, they should be hiring them now. And eight thousand dollars shouldn't be like the difference between getting those people employed. Well, so that's what, is, that's the problem. With well, this. this is well. I I just use when I formulated this. I use my experience hiring people, thousands of them uh, here in this area. And there's certain and just my communications and my you know work with the chamber and other businesses here and around the country. There are a couple factors that always prevented and held people back up, especially in economic times that were a bit of uncertainty, i.e. the recession, now the pandemic. It's a finding people. Uh, the marketing and hiring costs are extremely prohibitive, um, more expensive than a, a small, normal small business could probably afford. The lost productivity during the OJT or the trading aspect, we're trying to bring that employee up. And then mitigation of risk on hiring someone who's unemployed in this marketplace and mitigating the risk of whether or not they're gonna stay over 60 days or not in order to start recouping some of that. Those negatives actually, they, they cause hesitation in the marketplace. They cause hesitation for our businesses in hiring people when they could, they should. If that, if that, um, if that risk was mitigated, they would. This is also built upon the concept of a federal program that's been running successfully called the Work Opportunity Tax Credit Program, or WOTC, which is a federal program administered by the state, reimbursed by the IRS, or Treasury Department, that talks about hiring underemployed individuals in certain categories. They actually recognize the fact that those individuals during the initial period of time are less productive. So you can actually get 40% of your employees' pay reimbursed back to you in the form of a tax credit. This is a little bit simpler, but it's a concept that it's matching. Um, and in my conversations with businesses throughout the pandemic, this is something that they talked about a lot. They didn't, A, they didn't want um, a selective uh, program that they may or may not have gotten depending upon their business status that they had applied for. They didn't want something that mimicked the pine tree development zones, for example, that were 30 pages in length with massive reporting. They just needed that stimulus that 
capital in order to go ahead and take that step on hiring someone, um, knowing that they had some comfort in doing so. That was where this program came. It's a very immediate um, impact reimbursement towards our small businesses starting October 1st. Yeah, that means, and if we can get it done at the admin level, that means people, depending upon what the council said, if they brought this up for vote, can they start hiring people now for recovery in 2021? So, but the governor did, just to bring that up too, the governor did bring out and roll out her plan, ironically, the same day we talked about this initially. There is some s structural differences though. Her plan is more of a reimbursement for existing loans that were taken out during the pandemic by small businesses. That's one part. The other part is reimbursement of healthcare costs and so forth that were incurred during the pandemic. So looking at this now, I do not see that there's any overlap um, with any existing program that the state or the federal government has, other than WOTC, but it's a little bit different. Yeah, I'll just add, um, our business is the recruiting business. That's what I do for a living. And I've also, on my side business, I've had a PPP, and um, we've also done a EIDL, a, a economic <coughs> disaster loan. The average cost to hire a per, an employee for a small business is somewhere between three and four thousand dollars. The costs of onboarding, training, background checks, all the stuff that you go through as a standard in the HR world, it's somewhere between three and four thousand for any company. So there is a significant cost associated with bringing somebody on. And the other thing that the work opportunity tax credit, veterans are someone that you get uh, that are qualify for a work opportunity tax credit and they have different levels depending on their status when they transition out of the military. So it can be up to $9,000 per veteran depending on disability levels and things like that. So this type of a program is beneficial to businesses and especially if you reduce the number of requirements for the business to be, if you just accept the fact that in this environment I was saying to Belinda, you might have existing employees that are, you're paying 17, but you can't hire someone for 17 anymore because there's nobody out there. So there's, there's things that are in, in intangible costs in the business community that you can't put your finger on that this will help compensate for. So, because there, there are not a ton of people out there looking for a job right now. So that feels like I'm subsidized. Like, that feels like Auburn is now subsidizing training for certain small businesses. Yes. It doesn't seem. That's correct. Absolutely. All small sm businesses. How many small businesses do we have then in the city? Do we know uh, that? I mean, last I counted, we had 2,600 registered businesses. To the ones that are small or not small, I, I don't know. But I will say this, a vast majority of all small businesses in Maine, excuse me, all businesses in Maine are small businesses. You have very few that meet the federal criteria of large business, which is over 500 employees. Under, fi <laughs> under 50 is the vast majority, and if you just kind of do that mental drive, um, it's there. Um, there. You're not subsidizing. What you're doing is we are literally using this money to pick winners, and the winners are the businesses that are in Auburn. That's bottom line is we are giving Auburn-based businesses a competitive advantage to hire a finite amount of unemployed people in a dwindling workforce so that they can stay economically viable for the next generation. I think that we're on the wrong side of this equation though because if people are gonna be putting out a listing for hire, they have the funds to hire that individual and $4,000 isn't gonna make or break whether or not they choose to hire. But if you're incentivizing the employee to stay, that will inevitably help that business. I don't think that $4,000 to help somebody hire is gonna change that business outcome. Yeah, I no. think it will change the individual and whether or not they stay at an organization. And it's, it's an employee market right now. 4.3 million people left the workforce in August alone in our country. People need incentive to work. I don't think incentivizing the business is where we should be on this end. But that rolls down an employee. And I just, I, no, I'll it's just hard. Add, I mean, in I've, that business, yeah. my clients are businesses. So. I respect your opinion, but I respectfully disagree with what Oh, I'm not saying that there's not a cost. Yeah, there absolutely is a cost to bring people on. I've hired many people myself, but I don't think that it'll have the long-term outcome that we're looking for here. I think it's gonna have definitely a short-term outcome to get people in. It is, and I, from my person, and I, I, we could argue the pros and cons, I think this is explaining the program. It's not up for a vote right now. I will say, 
that supporting our businesses is a fundamental priority of the American Recovery Protection Act. That is in its ethos of what it's supposed to do. It is up to, and thankfully, us and five other municipalities in Maine have the luxury of crafting programs specifically to our individual businesses, communities, individuals, infrastructure. Um, that's something that actually only five other communities in Maine have that ability to do. Um, so I will say that this is a good dialogue to have, especially if you have a good working idea of businesses and you're talking to them out in your ward, um, or if you've owned them or currently own small businesses, you can put this together. So I will say, to get to Councillor Walker's point, this was not done in a vacuum. This was done as a pilot program based upon real world scenarios up to and understanding what the average hourly wage is, a median hourly, hour, hourly wage is in Auburn, what hiring looks like, making sure that that individual is someone who is, quote unquote, our definition of chronically underemployed or unemployed, and making sure that there's a stick. Now, if you also look, Councillor Boss, hired for recruitment and training allowance, right? Recruitment can also be stay bonuses as well. So when you're bringing someone in, that is definitely a flexibility that you want to provide businesses or businesses have. They do have that with that, with this program. So, um, and that was an important part because stay bonuses are part of the package. Every business has to be somewhat unique in order to be competitive. So. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh. A couple of things. One, I think everybody realizes that if money goes to this, it isn't spent on some other project with ARPA funding. And we've got a number of other projects. So some might not be funded because of spending money on this. So I think one of the things about bringing this up and in some ways privileging this project because we're hearing a lot more about it and you're not gonna hear about the other projects until we've actually finished our work um, seems maybe a little bit cart before the horse. Also, you mentioned previously, I don't see it here, that the person had to be unemployed for at least two weeks. That was in the original, has that changed? No, no. Is it there? No, vote for that. If I would was not in be the original, in favor of that. The original? The, I'm not sure if it was in the original. I knew it was talked about, but I'm not sure if it's I mean, up it was there or in not. The, in the, these plans that we got here about the ARPA funds. So. I've written on that memo, it's, I don't see it. Does anybody else see it? No, it's not, because I read that through, but in the, in, well, the okay, plan so, that, in the plan that we were presented, that was part of it. For, so my question about that is, are you working with the career center or something to get people who have not been employed for at least two weeks into this program? Because that's a very different animal if you are bringing those people in to give them skills and train them and hire them and pay them a good wage than if you're just a guy or a woman well, hopping can, from one to <clears> I think next. we can probably talk about the pros and cons if this comes up, if the council wants to bring this up for debate, of course. I will say from a practical standpoint, and this goes and addresses some of the businesses that you talked with that had concerns. The more variables you introduce in a program, the more people you have to talk with, the more forms you have to look at, the more requirements have to be sated or satisfied, the less participation you have and the less effectiveness the program is. But is so. that a requirement? Because that was written um, it, as one of them in here. In there, but that is the memo that I sent out. It was definitely talked about. Um, it's not in there. It could be put in there if it came to council and a motion to amend was made in order for it to be added. And the number at least 60 days, is that based on something specific? Usually rates of attrition, if you're gonna lose an employee, the vast majority of your employees you lose prior to 30 days of employment. 60 days adds an extra cushion. And this are, we're talking standardized hourly employees. Just about Councillor Carrier, if you I, have something to add. The reason that I'd ask to bring it up is because several of the businesses that I've talked to have had the issue and, and to Councillor Milks and to Councillor McLeod's standpoint, it, it does make a difference because businesses do have some money to do this, but some companies need 10 or 15 employees and they have enough money to train five. This is a, a huge uh, burden on them at this point having to replace all those employees. And if this helps out to give them more employees that they're able to hire, then this would be a benefit to those companies. And. <clears throat> I actually sort of thought that $4,000 was a little cheap because I spent the last five years of my career trying to hire people for a job that was comparatively fantastic, the best benefits <clears throat> in, in, in going. I hired, I had 500 interviews, I hired 175. I lost 35 of them before the, before the 60 days. I lost them before I could get them in the door. And this is, now this is after the cost that we've already talked about. 
because to get somebody to get to apply for a job for the federal government is fifteen hundred dollars if i'm going to get bring in brian to work on his phone <laughs> it's going to cost me fifteen hundred dollars by the time i can get him to walk through the door it's five thousand by the time that i get him through the first month it's salary plus fifteen thousand because i have to train them i have to provide vehicles for them so i'm looking for anything that will benefit these businesses and as we all know and you can drive down the street and see it we've got a problem with being, bringing people in and being able to retain them and, and anything that allows us to do that i think is a worthwhile to look at now do i think that everything is perfect no but that's why i wanted to be brought for us to discuss i think something like this is good for discussion but that's exactly do i think that this ought to be the thing that we vote on and have it be right tonight? No, because I want to hear what everybody's got to say about it. But I definitely think that it's worthwhile. Okay, question. If, let's say, the business community doesn't decide, we pass it at, and they say we don't, we're not interested. And, we, and no one applies, then the money rolls right back, right into, back into the, into the general pool. So we're not going to be spending all that ARPA before March. So does it, does the year it, March, though, at least. Well, but does it roll back into ARPA? Does it both roll back into ARPA? Okay. That's why we put the March 1st in there, too, uh, just because it gives us a short window of time mm -hmm. to understand whether or not it's effective or not. Um, and if it's not, then March 1st is, again, a short window of time. It rolls back into the general ARPA pool. But it would prevent us from setting aside this money or utilizing it for another program in the meantime. It is, but I'll give you this update later. Right now we're looking around six to seven million dollars that is in the priority mix out of a 13.6 total. So I think it's pretty safe to say that we have that money that could be earmarked. Can we edit the goals here? Because this is, this is not a program that's going to bring 100 to 150 or 50 to 100 employees into the private sector. This is going to defray the cost of hiring or recruiting 50 to 100. But the, this act is not bringing these individuals to these companies. Why not? Because as I am applying for a job, are they telling me the, the recruitment cost that I've used to bring you on as a new employee is being covered by the city of Auburn? And does that make any difference to me as somebody who's looking for jobs? It could, absolutely. So the, again, if you're, if you're looking to not support an attempt at business recovery, then shoot holes through this all day long. Well, if you have, no, excuse no, me, excuse me. If you have faith in the business community, which I've been part of for 20 years, okay, in this area, if you have faith in the business community, knowing that there's a need, then you support this. And whereas the goals might be fuzzy, maybe not, we can get drowned out in the weeds. But at the same time, we get drowned out in the weeds. We have businesses that are having issues and they're having problems. And this is one way that we can help support them. Because remember, during the entire pandemic, they paid taxes. Most of these businesses worked. Most of these businesses couldn't afford to pay a hazard pay for their employees at 84 Court or Heathcoes or wherever. You know, this is, these are small mom and pop businesses. This isn't you know, large multinational corporations here. These are your local lawn and garden folks. Well, then I'd rather, I would rather just get rid of all of these requirements, take $500,000 and spread it amongst them all without requirements and say, <laughs> go for it, please recruit people. And you know what I mean? That's, that's what I'm saying. I'd rather, I don't want to pick winners. If, we're, if the goal is to help local businesses, great, let's allocate money for it and do it. Then have zero bar to get into that and not have it be only for recruitment. That, that's what I'm saying. So this is a proposal. Let's go through. This is a proposal. If you have a different proposal, write it up and submit it to the ARPA committee. Okay, absolutely. If this does come up to a vote, Okay, vote against it or modify it got, and I vote got, for it. I got a question. So, uh, Councillor Boss, you think that, I just want to understand where you're, are you saying we should be subsidizing job seekers? I think, I, Cause that's to what me, I'm my question is Correct. what is the goal? And work our way backwards from what our goal is. Is our goal that these employers maintain these new employees over a certain number of months, years? Or is our goal to pay for the cost of employee, employers to bring on new people and not look at longevity and not look at, work, you know, not look at the workforce? I think that that's, that's my primary issue, is what is the goal that we're trying to accomplish and work our way backward? Well, how do you, so I'm... Because the goal I, here I says I'm to bring sure, on I'm 100 still... people, and I just think that either 
we should do that by incentivizing the people or change the goal to say that we are looking to defray the cost of recruitment, which I think is absolutely valid and legitimate, but then change it so, so that it's think, accurate. I'm just, want, I'm just trying to understand what you're oh, saying. Sure. So you would say, in, as example, take this money, and then if somebody works there for six months or 60 days, pay that person. Heck yeah. If you're having, what I'm hearing from everybody is that employers are having a really hard time finding people and keeping them. So you don't keep people by giving $4,000 to the employer, because that doesn't mean anything for the employee. They're, they're not gaining anything. But they're going to be recruited, they're and they're going to be hired, and they're going to be trained. But I mean, I just think, just being clear on the goals. I don't have any issue with helping businesses. I mean, we're all here to help businesses. ARPA's here to help businesses. That's what we're here for. My problem is that the goals and the program are misaligned. So pick one, and we'll work our way backward to hit that goal. Again, anybody in this council can actually present a program. Yeah. In a vacuum of no programs, this oh, is I'm, the program we have. I'm just here to respond to what's been put in front of No, no, no. You're here, to, you're here to promote activities which are going to strengthen the business community as well as the entire community of the city of Auburn. That's your job. That's all of our jobs. But in lack of that proposal, this is a proposal that we have. Love to see a different proposal. So well, all I'm the, saying is change when this comes up, we can amend it so that the goal is slightly different. But you've already said that we're not voting on it tonight. It's a workshop. So when it comes up later, but we'll provide an amendment. To, I mean, the goal is to help the private sector hire new people, not, not, to incur, not to pay existing employees to stay. That's not the goal. The goal is to okay. help the private sector hire more people. So you're, you're, the one that you're suggesting is a different idea is that we want to, the existing, pop, the existing employees, we want to bonus them for staying in their job. That's a different, that's a different goal than this. Absolutely, yes. Okay, but well that's not what we're, that's this program is. <laughs> I understand all these things. You had a comment? Doesn't matter. And you were saying that you want to just give every business money. If, that, if that's the end goal, that money will make these businesses better, yes, absolutely. If we're if subsidizing their hiring and recruitment, I would rather just give them unfettered money and say, here, we're going to spend $500,000 just to put your name down, be in good standing with the rest of it, and split it up that way. Councilor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The small businesses that I've talked with, they really like the idea of having a person like do a set up a temporary department to where they can go to to help them figure out what they best qualify to help grow their business, retain their employees. I mean, between whatever is offered through the state and federal programs, not just what we're doing here in Auburn. Some of them think that just offering some businesses money, I mean, what's good if I take the money and that person knows that they got to stay with me for at least 60 days. What happens when they go? Is that business still going to get that money? And if so? Yes. Okay, so they're going to still get the money. Mm -hmm. And now can they qualify for more money? Right now we have a cap at two employees per mm -hmm. year per business okay. period. See, more, most businesses need more than those two employees. Yeah, they, they do, but this is just kind of a pilot to see if it works. Right. Then but, you can quantify it and amend it later. But what they also need is money to help with training, like at maybe one of the technical college or the university, for people that, that are leaving another employment that needs to be trained. And it might need, I mean, we might be able to set up a matching grant to, uh, that they don't have to pay back as long as they work more than 60 days, maybe six months, maybe a year. Okay, when you're, when you're done. Well, sure. Jason. Yes. I'll let you and then you can. So you've mentioned the community college. So yeah. this is a real world example. So I'm partners in a small construction company, okay? CMMC has a carpenter's program, two year carpenter's program that's got 15 people in it. They are almost unemployable when they get out because they have no experience. There's no, they're because of all the rules around bringing on an apprentice, they're almost, they're not much help because they've got impractical, they know how to, 
impractical, but they don't know what working on a job site and working up, and that costs the employee, the employer, the time of that person that you're paying them, and they're not making you any money. So something like this for a small construction company to get four or eight thousand dollars to hire one of those kids from CMMC that have some basic know how to run a saw, know how to hammer a little bit, know how to run it, but they don't know anything about a job site and how to build a couple of months of putting them through a process. That's somewhere where something like this and the, the career center, there's a state, there's a state program that kicks back some money to people. They're all very difficult to do because they put all these rules on what you can do and what you can't do with them. But there's, there are programs that are employee based that kick back to the employee half their wage. That through the, the Department of Labor, in which we deal with the <coughs> Department of Labor every day, it's why companies don't do it because they're impossible to deal with. So I'm just saying there are real world examples of where this would be helpful. And there are real businesses out there that could benefit from it. And I'm just telling you, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm absolving myself or whatever, recusing myself because our little construction company could use this. I won't because of my position, but it's a perfect example. I got two guys that are 60 years old that we can't hire anybody. So there's some ideas. Good conversation, I think. Hopefully, Councillor Walker, Councillor Carrier got your questions answered. I think there's some other proposals that I'm hoping other councillors yeah. want to actually put forth. Um, I think there's some consensus here, some, not all, that the concept of helping small businesses is important and sooner versus later is good. So we'll take that information uh, and we're going to run for it. I think, you know, think about time is of the essence, of course, with our businesses. And uh, let's hopefully use that as a motivating factor and, and get something to help them out, okay? Also, just finally, within the context of the larger ARPA funding and everything else that we're looking at, just so we know that if money is spent in one place, it doesn't go to another place. And we've got, yes, we've come up with nine million, but there are plenty that we put aside. Well, there also may be other places that we don't agree that you're gonna spend the money to, mm -hmm. so. So, but That's but should we bring them all back to a workshop? And if we should, yeah. then we need to take get rid of the Ar get rid of the ARPA committee because then we're just usurped it here. Well, listen, hold on. As I said earlier, for four years I've created ad hoc committees, and every time I created an ad hoc committee, I got talked to by councillors saying you're just trying to usurp the city council. I made it very very clear when we formed this committee that the city council had final say. They could go through their process, bring anything forth at any time based upon the priorities of their wards and their constituency. I made it very clear, that's what's happening, okay? That's a good process. Are we usurping the ad hoc committee? Absolutely not. Are we taking things because certain counselors think that it's a priority? Um, absolutely, and that, that doesn't stop. That's a good thing, that's a good process. This is the American Recovery Act, Plan Act. This is about recovery. And if any counselor here has any program that they feel is a low risk, potentially high reward, low effort, bring it forward, okay? Our people don't deserve to wait for bureaucracy or, or unnecessary due diligence. So this is a good process. And having everything, waiting for everything to come out, we've been, the whole point is to bring things up as they come about, and we have. The <coughs> Sustainability Auburn program is a huge success. I'm glad we brought that up, okay? Because it's really going to impact people. It is impacting people. So I'm sure there's other programs too. Bring them up. Okay, they're good programs. Just, just a quick add on to that. I would hope that, you know, whatever you guys bring forward, we get to see the, you know, all of it. I, I don't want to see anything left out because we may agree with, with everybody as far as what the programs are that we're going forward, but that may make one of us think of, well, what about this? Could we do this? And, and I personally like seeing all the ideas. Uh, you guys can still have the list that you came up with. But if there's something on the list that I, you know, that I wasn't made privy to because I didn't get my dead butt up and bring it into the, count, in the chamber to meet with you guys, I would like to see all of it just in there. We're going to see what you guys brought forward, but I'd sort of like to see all the ideas because it's, you know, there may be something just like we're doing right now that we're going, oh, well, what about this and what about, because Katie just brought up something about this. If we're doing what type of program, 
why are we putting it why are we putting a caveat on it so given that kind of discussion amongst all of us I think that there could be ideas that are brought up that for all the programs and that we're using that as a base like I, I, I will there is there is part of my update today was bringing forth the high priority items. I think there was nine of them um, on November 15th. Okay, so I was going to mention that today, but yes, you're going to see that priority list. All those nine are high prioritized items uh, based upon risk, reward, effort. Okay, and so. also the ad hoc committee doing its work. So we've gone through and looked at all these and heard about them and then are choosing some. Now, if you want to see all, I can't remember, there are six pages of them that we've gone through and reduced. Where does that put kind of the work that we're doing as the ad hoc committee? We're going to see all the ones that you brought forward, but we'll also get to see what you didn't bring forward. I mean, mm -hmm. we're going to discuss all of them, but if we see something in there that wasn't brought forward for a certain reason, then that from that list, we could bring that forward. Well, now, that, will, that will might be a 10-hour meeting. Okay, uh, but you'll see everything, and we're not going to go through everything. We'll go through the top nine prioritized items, well, um, yeah, and then you have you'll you'll have it. You know, four days prior, you can go through it yourself and look, and it's pretty outlined. It's right here. I mean, there's justification, reasons, cost, benefit analysis. So, yeah. you know, you'll be able to see that. Um, but it's a good list. It's a good process. So, I'm going to move on, and from this item, um, and we're going to move on to the next agenda item now. It's 20 minutes to 7. Eric, do you have enough time to go through with the PowerPoint now or for 15? I wasn't planning on going through a lot of details of the overall plan. That will come to you no matter what on the 15th. I really wanted some feedback on the planning board's recommendations to okay. change the plan. I just want to make sure you have enough time. Huh? We're going to take our last workshop item and we're going to drop that under communications. I'm not even sold on that. I'm not dying on that. So the overall um, comprehensive plan has been to the council uh, a couple times in workshop settings, um, as well as the planning board um, was tabled in September. The planning board took it back up last week on Tuesday. Um, that plan is scheduled to come before the council for a public hearing on November 15th. Um, one thing that the planning board recommended as a change to the draft that was presented to them, um, I was hoping to get feedback from the council on so I know what to prepare for the, the public hearing. Um, next month, uh, next, uh, next meeting rather, November 15th. Um, or if you're uncertain, then we can certainly prepare both options for that public hearing. Uh, much of the um, re existing residential zone in the Lake Auburn watershed is currently rural residential, um, and that under the future land use plan would become this uh, purple uh, color, the, the one sort of centered, the lighter purple, um, and that would change those residential areas from a one acre uh, per unit uh, standard with 250 feet of street frontage uh, to a two units per acre, so a half an acre per unit uh, from the current one acre, um, and 100 feet of frontage. Uh, overall, in the planning board discussion, the board was comfortable with that in the areas where it was recommended with the exception of the Lake Auburn watershed. Um, there were enough board members that felt that the recent um, release of the Lake Auburn watershed study um, the information that was presented in that, um, that they haven't had time to digest. Um, they recommended that instead of changing that um, rural residential district, the one acre, 250 feet frontage per house lot, um, to uh, about half that with 100 feet of frontage, they recommended that within the Lake Auburn watershed, um, we use this rural standard, the one at the center of your screen. So the current area, again, one acre per house, 250 feet of frontage. The planning board's recommending that we change those in the future land use map to be one house per three acres or a three acre minimum lot size. So the lot size in the watershed for those areas would triple, um, resulting in a lower density um, until the planning board and council get a chance to digest that study. 
and the frontage requirement would be reduced to 200 feet. Um, there was no magic to the 200 versus 250, um, but that was a way to use one of the existing <coughs> districts um, and still protect the watershed in the planning board's eyes from any any impacts from changing the lot size to a smaller size. So what we're really hoping for is uh, some kind of a temperature check on um, would the council like me to just present that with the larger lot size or do you want to see both of them um, as part of the public hearing to decide it? so fundamentally if i could just paraphrase what the planning board i watched the meeting uh the planning board proposed was basically a stopgap placeholder if you would um kind of going by the though know, they didn't say it first do no harm in order to keep the data points and the variables within the lake auburn water study consistent so that we had something to look at at a future at a future date Yep, and okay. partly to move the <clears throat> remainder of the plan forward rather than hold the whole thing up for the, the watershed. Design. This moves 75% of the plan forward, 25% of Auburn's land mass is in the watershed, and this really doesn't do anything bad, and it just still allows those, those, uh, the data sets from the study to be accurate. Okay. Tim, you were on the FLU plan. Your thoughts on this are important. Yeah, no, that... that that may that makes sense now especially now that the lake auburn study is out and my question would that just be an overlay so it would be residential except you know there would just be a caveat that says residential except in the lake auburn watershed overlay and then that would result uh excuse me default to the rural section to so the standard excuse me yeah, this map. i think we actually map. literally color coded rural thank you bill ah, there you um go. so the map on the right is the future land use map the map on the left is the current zoning um so all of, in the current zoning on the left all of those dark green areas those are currently low density country residential those remained that rural standard um, the brown areas went from one acre to a half an acre um, and their the board was recommending that instead of going to that half an acre within the lake auburn watershed we use that that larger low density three acre standard for for the entire water it does make that a lot of the existing zoning though more restrictive um, because there are a lot of half acre acre or excuse me acre potential lots there now um, I don't believe just looking at the planning board permit pulls that we have any houses on less than three acres out in that area but I do think that we need to make sure that there is a way or an avenue if someone did um, either have or have planned to build a home under the existing zoning let's say it was a two acre lot that they still could move forward or at least have a time frame that work had to be done to firm this up permanently within six to 12 months with regards to the watershed. Yeah, I throw that out there because it's, this is a placeholder, but it is making lots non-conforming. That was going to be my question is if there was a way to put a, a time frame on it, before, you know, get it approved as, as it's looking now, but with that caveat of, you know, you, you now have 12 <clears throat> months before the new standards kick in. If, if it's going to make your lot non-conforming and you had intended to do something, now's your time to pull a permit. Or, or it re, um, reverts back to initially proposed FLU. Right. Somewhere in there. So in, in this lays out the future guidance for you to make zoning decisions. Okay. So this doesn't actually change the zoning, but um, it would prevent you from implementing the half acre lot size in that meantime. But in the meantime, the zoning would still be in place at one acre, 250, until this board takes an action to implement the recommendation of the future land use plan. Let me just, if I could, just real quick dovetail on what Tim just said. Um, I do think because we are creating non-conforming lots that we did, if we, in the final language pre-hearing, that we added that disclaimer saying, you know, for the next 12 months, the FLU will read the three acre, or the rural residential zone. But if no action, ordinance action is taken, the FLU will revert back to the initial or, or now current zoning. Not what was proposed, but the now current FLU map. Does that make sense? Because you don't want to make, we can't make this more restrictive forever because that's not the point. That actually will also um, throw off the data points and the modeling that the, st uh, that the study uh, conducted. Again, this is an ordinance, it's FLU, but you should have a time frame. And 12 months should be, long enough well i think yeah but this is a 10-year plan so unless we actually bring it up to change you know unless we bring it to council to change the to say we're going to do all this in the watershed we're going to make it this it's going to stay where it is now this is just futuristically where we'd like it to you know where we'd look go so it's a stopgap until we take action we could never take action on it in 10 years and it's going to be what it is today 
So that, that's the other part. It, the ordinance sure. that we come up with, if we do to craft it, would, should have that sunset on it. And, and there was discussion um, in the planning board about this idea. They called it grandfathering, but it's basically just what we're talking about here to make sure that somebody doesn't completely have the rug pulled out from under them for plans that they're already in process. That happens actually now. And we'll be talking to them about the protections that are in place for that and whether or not there's any gaps that they want to recommend or adjust. Mm -hmm. I feel comfortable having just the one scenario come in front of the council, the amended by the planning board version. We have any, cons you have any I, other questions I on agree. this? Solely on the Lake Water. Uh, Lake this is Water. just on Lake Auburn Watershed. Correct. No other questions, comments? Everybody's kind of been kind of an improvement on this. This is what we want to see come forth for public hearing on the 15th and final vote. Okay. Eric, Thank is there you. anything else you want to cover on That's this? It. That gives us every need, everything we need for the 15th. Well, let me, while we have, we got a couple minutes. I don't want to go into our last workshop item quite yet because I want to give us just a five minute break. Is there any other question? There's a huge packet in our agenda, a huge section of the packet. Um, that talked about FLU. Did anybody have any other questions about the FLU, proposed language, what was adopted by the planning board? Tim? I, so <clears throat> the one thing that I, from the Lake Auburn study that I wanted to look at getting, and I don't know if future land use is where it goes, but putting the um, low density, the low, LDI. thank you, the, yes. LDI, LDI. LDI, yes. Uh, development standards to make sure that if there is any development in our watershed, that you know there are barriers to mitigation <clears> to the lake. Um, I don't know if that's in there as a, as as one of our bullet points, but I would, again, we can amend that after. But I think that's a good thing to have because that also gives us leverage to the rest of the watershed. That hey, we don't want our water, you know, bad. We're going to do it here, and hopefully that streams upward. Yeah. Eric, could you put together just a, um, a rough list, uh, for us to potentially look at amending the FLU on November 15th, that would include all those recommendations that had to do with development. And we're not talking about the number of homes or anything like that, <clears throat> but they're, they're good, smart recommendations based on data. It was LID, low impact yeah, development. There it is. There was uh, state conformity with septic systems. And I think there was one or two more too. And that I've heard from constituents about the, them concerns about the septic systems. They can read the data, the data's pretty clear. I'm just saying, so to bring that forward as well would yeah. be important. The data was, was smart. It's a lot to put together for the 15th, so I, we could try. Um, How about a term in there just referencing the Lake Auburn Water Study recommendations on future build-outs? Yep, that would be simple. Tim? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's fine. Okay. I just think bringing, have, if you can <clears throat> put something in the pack, or at least have that in the packet, that page, just so we can all see it, to have mm -hmm. the low, just so it's there. But yeah, I think referencing it would be a good idea. Is there anything else? Any other questions? None being. Okay, that's it. Eric, thank you very thank you. much. We'll look forward to the 15th seeing that. Okay. This time, declare a recess. We'll go six minutes and we're going to come back into the chamber room for our normal scheduled meeting.
Oh. Oh, thank you. Efficiency means sustainability, Arbor. I'd like to call the order. I'd like to call the order of this meeting. Auburn City Council, November 1st, 2021. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, next we have two items, excuse me, two consent items on the agenda. I'm going to entertain a motion at this time. So moved. Two. Second. Councillor McLeod, second from Councillor Milks. All those in favor, raise your hand. Opposed, none being, passes. 7 0. Next are the minutes of the October 18th, 2021 regular City Council meeting. Are there any corrections? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of October 18, 2021, regular City Council meeting. So moved. Second. I got McLeod and Councillor Walker on the second. All those in favor? Opposed? Passes 7 0. Next, we're going to roll right into communications, presentations, and recognitions. Uh, <clears throat> the first thing we're going to do is actually finish a workshop item that we could not get to in the previous workshop due to time. So we moved that over, and that is going to be to discuss city council, um, school committee, planning board, mayor, compensation. I'm going to turn it over to the city manager and give us a run through. And there's also a memo in your packet too to follow along. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Brian, if you could just switch it over to my laptop so I can bring that up. Thanks. I'm sorry, Brian. Brian Susie. We have a few extra. Brian, Brian. that's <laughs> Brian Wong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you'll see up on the screen, uh, Mayor and Council, uh, there will, has been discussions, I believe, uh, well, we have former Councilor Titus here who brought this before the Council in, at the last term uh, regarding compensation changes. As the compensation currently sits with the mayor and council and the school committee, was approved on November 8th, 2005 uh, at the current rates. That has not been changed since. There was an ordinance change in 2013. The ordinance just was to include the existing language out of the charter. There was no change in the compensation, but you would see an ordinance change in 2013 as it relates to compensation. But the total compensation for all the positions at 21,150 has not changed. You'll see that there's been a considerable amount of discussions throughout the state with other communities regarding uh, compensation for elected officials. What I provided for you here is a range of what we've seen in other communities as far as um, what the uh, compensation packages look like. When we talked about the, the ad hoc committee on, com on committees, um, we discussed the fact that the planning board and the regulatory board currently does not receive any compensation. Uh, I noted that in here, they're currently at zero. However, again, if you're looking at a range uh, for those two uh, boards based on what we've seen with other communities, that would be the range that you would look at. Um, and then also brought up uh, was regarding council committee assess assignments rather uh, so there would be an additional could be an additional amount uh, if it wasn't brought into a full cap for the counselors itself so if the counselors were to remain the same or slightly more you could also add uh, council committee assignments capped at two committees um, so that there would be an additional compensation for those committee assignments also within some other communities there is health insurance um, that is included in uh, some of those compensation amounts. So I put in here, just so you would know what a cost of a, a single plan in the city of Auburn under our current health insurance, what that cost is. Based on the language in the charter, any increase in the compensation would take effect in the new elected term. So if the council, if based on consensus here, if the council wanted to move forward with any changes, this would then be brought up um, at, the, uh, at the next Council meeting on November 15th uh, with any any potential changes. I do not have any specific recommendations. 
uh, one thing that we did look at uh, as we've um, IACP has talked about I'm sorry ICMA rather has talked about it's been a long time since I've been with IACP which is the International Tusa Police Association so I'll eventually start shifting over to ICMA but ICMA has talked about uh, this issue it was even brought up at our uh, conference that we attended when it talked about elected officials and uh, inclusion part of the issue with inclusion or the challenge rather or barrier with inclusion is that do we have people running for office that um, may have a barrier to running for office because of uh, the compensation and uh, you know we were running some just some quick numbers and taking a look at if someone needed to a uh, higher daycare or child care to attend um, the council meetings plus two uh, committee assignments that would be a cost of just under two thousand dollars a year uh, for that individual uh, to have to pay out of pocket to make sure they they could attend attend this meeting so I think that's that's part of that inclusion how can we ensure that somebody who's running could do this and say okay I can at least cover my cost uh, obviously you all know no one is in this business as an elected official because it's a money maker um, or anything like that it's just could we do something with compensation to ensure that uh, we're not excluding anyone from that process so I'd encourage you to keep that in mind as you you have the discussion this was placed around discussion because this is about the last time that you could talk about it at a workshop to get it on an agenda to make that happen before the next before the next term if the council feels that no the amounts are fine then we can move off this workshop but this is this is why this was placed if I could let me just start off the conversation with a little intelligence and kind of a preamble here this is never and we've I've gone through this we've gone through this before as a council last term it's not a quote-unquote popular conversation to have and it's usually very uncomfortable um, but I, I do think that we should have that open conversation about the reality of the environment in which we're in and really the reality of, of what costs are time constraints um, and truly costs and I'll lead it off and I've talked to a lot of my peers around the state um, and around the country I can't have these conversations with my peers in other parts and other states because they a they laugh at us because we don't pay our mayors um, second they don't take us seriously and that's happened a couple times in conferences um, I'm not sure what you're in the conversations you all had on that one Phil at ICMA but that was interesting but forget that bring that closer to home mayors spend a lot of time mayors outside of Portland Portland's a full time so we'll take that out of the equation looking at peers in Westbrook Augusta Lewiston here in Auburn you know we roughly spend we're talking about this probably around 750 hours a year okay full-time position is roughly 2,000 hours a year in general so 750 hours throw that out there during a pandemic it was 2,000 easy uh, during a uh, Suska Centennial it was way over 750 but not 2,000 okay so there are some anomalies there but when you're looking at time you're looking at what that what parts of the day it is most of the meetings a mayor has are up at the legislature between 9 and 5. They're here with city staff between 9 and 5. It's the rare meetings that are actually in the evening. Um, so that really comes into play. Council, I'm not sure. It'd be interesting to know what you think on an annualized basis, the amount of time you put into um, doing council work, what you should put into doing council work too. Some of us have just much more time. and We can put more time in, but being realistic, that's kind of the, the numbers on the mayor's side, just to put in a perspective. And I will say that looking at the median average hourly income, according to Payscale and that other job site based on census data, was $17.36 per hour in Auburn. Actually, ironically, one of the lower hourly or lowest hourly scales out of the top 10 cities in the state um, compared to Portland, South Portland, and so forth. So that's kind of give you an idea, a framework for that conversation, okay? So, um, and just FYI, I think $4,000 a year is what I spend at Raleigh's on breakfast. Leroy, I guarantee you, spends more than that. Um, so, open up the conversation. Anybody have any thoughts on this? Um, I wanna hear what people have to say about the other amounts, but I think the planning board should definitely get compensated. They frankly, if they're doing their jobs, which they are, 
are spending a lot of time when I think of the planning board meetings I've gone to and the materials they have to not only read but understand um, it's often quite complex so I I'm in favor of compensating planning board members. I don't know what the amount would be, but I'm just in favor of compensating. Well, so, so let's start with that if we're good with that, because I think some of that low-hanging fruit we can all agree with. So planning board, zero currently. Lewiston, I think, just went up to $1,250 a month, or excuse me, a year on planning board from 600 Is there any consensus for a 600 to $1,200 range for planning board members annually? Yes, and I think it be, should be commensurate with what they're doing in Lewiston. Councilor Carrier, Councilor Boss, recent planning board members, thoughts? It takes an extensive amount of time to work through those packets, and these packets for city council are equally as large, but I would say that technically it takes a lot of time to look at design of site plans and understand them and be able to speak to them in the meetings. So I definitely think that we should be compensating planning board members. I do think broadly, though, for all of these, Seats, I don't, I don't necessarily see a difference between them, but I do think we should look at the amount of time spent and then what the equivalent um, opportunity cost is for each hour spent, taking into account barriers. So we need to make sure that it, whatever, however many hours your meetings are, what the average cost per hour for a babysitter is should be bare bones minimum, what every single person is paid regardless of their seat on mayor, council, school committee, or otherwise. Do we have a range? Councilor Carrier, thoughts on this? I'm doing some. I would, I would agree with Councilor uh, Boss in regards to that. Uh, the planning board has a extensive packages on every meeting uh, to go through, and I think that the $1,200 range would be a good start. At this point, we did some work on babysitting, child care. Do you want to go a little bit more detail on what you're coming up with uh, in the example? or? Well, I would say a couple people that did it do not hire babysitters, but we, so I would, I would say, sure. I think we, we might need to look at that a little further, but um, just based off from, you know, if, if it was costing, say, $35 per, um, per meeting, um, and if you were a counselor that had your 20, you know, you know upwards of uh, 26 meetings, plus your two uh, committee <coughs> meetings, uh, meeting once a month, it's uh, 1750 what I'd like to propose at this time, if I can get some consensus, remember this is just a workshop. This can be amended during the order reading next meeting, but we got to put something other than a range. Uh, looking at from zero to what Lewiston's doing now, considering this is the first time, I recommend $750 annually for a planning board member, both associate and full member um, for the year and an extra $100 stipends per month for the chair, because the chair does put more hours in on a monthly basis. Uh, that would be roughly seven, um, actually just did that, $8,000 combined annually. Is there any other recommendations? Or I'm sorry, can you, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, can you clarify, so you're saying that just a full planning board member would be paid how much per year? I said full and associate which of which are nine, is $750 annually. The chair of the planning board, chosen from its membership, would receive an additional $100 a month, or excuse me, $100 for the year, as stipends for being chair. So $100 for the year? Yep, so for the year, and I apologize for not making that clear. That would put the total at $68.50 for compensation. So the, the regular members are getting $750 for a year, and the chair is getting $850, fifty. and in Lewiston they're getting $1,250. Um, yes, they're getting $1,200. I think it should be closer to what they're paying in Lewiston, because I think the city, the work that needs to be done is comparable between the two cities. Councilor Gary? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Point of information. Is it a done deal in Lewiston, these changes? It or is. Are they, they voted on it. Or so it's not going to go through their charter amendment process? It Do doesn't have to, no. They voted on it. It's done. It takes effect next session. Does the planning board meet twice a month or once a month? They meet once a month unless there's a special meeting, which happens rarely, but it does happen. They had one just last month. 
How long's an average planning board meeting? An How long's an average, an average, average council meeting? planning <laughs> board meeting. Average. <clears throat> Two, three, four. Yeah. How long do you think you prep for it on the on the backside beforehand? Prep. prep. Personal prep. <laughs> I mean, it depends. Depends. Or, I mean, I spent hours. Yeah. Never. It really depends on if it's FLU or if it's approving a you know contract zone. Yeah. But you have you have. You got a lot the, to look at. I mean, you're looking to. Break, you have the breakdown for all the plans that you go through. You're looking at all the plans. You're looking at all the paperwork that's you know, commensurate with that stuff. So yeah, you're spending quite a bit of time. Okay. Well, and in, in keeping with the conversation about supporting the business community, you're sitting there with the business in front of you oftentimes. And the best thing that we can do is ensure that people have read the packet, understand it, and do their due diligence in adjudicating the cases that come before the planning board. So I do think, I mean, yeah. it's, it's a professional board or it should be treated as such. It is a professional board. And there's something to be said, too. When you do pay someone, you expect a certain level of work and output, okay? Um, there's a, What's that old saying? You get what you pay for. If you pay for nothing, that's usually what you're going to get as an outcome. Um, so, or at least we want to try to mitigate that potential from happening. That's how I always look at an equation. Um, is there any other recommendation on different? I understand Councilor Rosani said thinks it should be more. I'm just looking for right now something to move this to November 15th. And if this effectively moves the question and we got consensus on that, then we can move on to one of the other positions. Councilor Carrier? I would move the school, school committee. That's commensurate to with what the council needs. Okay, so let's go planning board, then we'll go school committee. Planning board, we're good. Mr. Manager? Got it. Okay, 750 plus 100. Okay, let's move on to the school committee. School committee, Brian. The school committee has. An equal job to what the council Brian, can you talk into your uh, council? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the school committee has a, a job commensurate with that of the council uh, in dealing with the school and the budgetary process and the, the planning and things. So I think that the uh, school committee should be bumped up to commensurate with the council. School committee equal to the council? Yeah. 50%. Any thoughts on that? Right now, the council pays 18. No. Council pay, I'm sorry, annually, current? 18, oh, I'm sorry, $1,800 annually. School committee is 650 So moving that up to whatever the city council ends up as, so it's an equal pay. Okay. Um, school committee verifies, meets twice a month, plus you have subcommittees that meet once or more a month. Yes. Okay. On average, hours equal to that as you put in for the city council? Um, I don't think there's anybody has any doubt whatsoever the responsibilities are less of that of this body either. So it's different. W wouldn't the school themselves have to agree to that? No. No. We, we pay we all of that. that? We do. Is there any other questions or comments? Jill, can you just confirm which account does that come out of? They pay their they own. They pay their own. But However, we have budget. However, we would set the rate it comes from the council. I say we, the council, but the amount comes out of their budget. The school committee has subcommittees also. You have mm -hmm. curriculum, building, uh, policy. There's <clears throat> all kinds of subcommittees under the, the school committee also. And there was an additional bullet point of an idea of an additional stipends on top of a base. It could be the same base, whatever, of uh, just a different way of rewarding or at least acknowledging that which is up there. It's $25 per meeting uh, per month capped at two. That would be for subcommittee meetings. Um, and that could be applicable for council as well as school committee. Though just in my, you know, just watching Brian and the last four years watching the school committee, I argue that they probably have a lot more subcommittees um, than we do. We really don't have subcommittees. We have different boards we're on, but that'd be applicable too. So that's something to think about as well. I'm not sure if you necessarily want to have them on top of each other, for, but as of in lieu of an increase in compensation, adding compensation based upon additional work. Is that, I have a question. Is the, the intent of 25 per meeting capped at two committees? So would that be $50 per month if I had two committees? Or if I had a, because I mean, I, I could meet every week with one of my committees. It's that, that's why I'm just trying to figure out where that cap is. Okay. I was assuming one committee meeting per month. Per month, okay. Gotcha. Cap that too. And these would be appointment appointed committees. These aren't just, I yeah. want to be on something committee because it's fun. Auburn Library, great example, right? That's an appointed committee, so. Now are we proposing the health insurance? Well, we'll get to that too. I think that's 
I mean, the health insurance is something there too. Here's a question. How many, and I'll, I'll ask this for city council, if, we, if we're all in agreement, and let me just settle this really now, are we all in agreement that the school committee pay on an annualized basis should equal that of the city council, whatever that is, variable right now? Correct? Yeah. We have agreement, nods? No. Nods, okay. So, <clears throat> that actually helps make things, the conversation a little bit easier because we're talking about two bodies instead of one. The health insurance plan is something that is out there, and, and Phil could probably speak a little bit more of it because it's a city program. The thought was, if you have an elected official that is actually meeting the time requirements and the, you know, by charter, if that's what their job is, they qualify for part-time benefits, is that helpful? Should that be offered to that individual, whatever those part-time benefits are? Um, and that was there because I've heard from a peer mayor of mine who was like, this is difficult, but if I had health insurance, then I could get off my wife's health, and health insurance, we get a little extra from her business, and I could actually afford to be a mayor. So that's where that kind of slid in. Um, so that's a concept. I think the question is, does the amount of work the city council and the school committee equal that definition of a city part-time employee? I, I think it's a lot of money. I don't think, do you have, what are other cities doing? Uh, other like comparable cities. I haven't heard of health insurance being paid except for. Portland. Careful. Except for Portland, at least in Maine. But I gotta tell you, Maine is a complete anomaly when it comes nationally, Phil. Yeah, I think, you know, as we did some research, um, the mayor's certainly correct. It, it does change, but also changes with the amount of workload that they're also doing. Um, you know, I think across the board, counties shifted away from that. Um, I think Andrew Scoggin removed that in 2008, somewhere oh, yeah. around there. That was lifetime. Where they had that allocation right. for county commissioners. Um, and then, as the mayor said, I think, you know, Portland is the only one I'm aware of. And... Um, for the mayor, and, um, and then I know other states certainly do it, but their compensation is pretty high as well. So because they're obviously um, considered more part-time to full-time counselors. Are we speaking just for the mayor position for the health insurance or for everybody? No, I think that's, that was just put in as, would, what would health insurance look like mm -hmm. as a cost? Yeah. Not, could, for, it, not for an individual position. It could be everybody. I mean, it really depends on the hours. I'll give you an example, just because I can speak of it myself, right? I'm putting 15 to 20 hours a week in, some because, sometimes because I have to, and I had to, and that will happen with every mayor, and sometimes because I wanted to, okay? But they're all over the place, the hours. For me to have a part-time job and maintain corporate-based health insurance, you have to have usually more than 32 hours on average a week. You have to be a full-time equivalent, an FTE. Um, or you're priving it out in the, you're buying it yourself in the private market, which I don't know if any of you pro buy your own health insurance in the private market. Very, very expensive for an individual. Hundreds and hundreds of dollars a month. So, more. More. <laughs> don't remind me. Um, so, this is something that can help people. Okay. Like if it was me, I would opt out of it. I wouldn't want it. I'm going to stay on my plan, my family plan. But it's nice to have. For someone else, it could be make or break the ability to actually serve the people of Auburn. And whether it be a ribbon cutting, a meeting, or going up to the legislature for eight hours, it could be, it could make the difference. But it should be an opt in or opt out type. The other benefit. thing about health insurance is it can change. Whereas we can set the rates for all these other payments, but I mean, it could go up to 11,000 next year. And uh, that's another concern that I would have about health insurance. Yeah. No, there's something. So on compensation, um, health insurance is out there. Let's talk about the mayor because, you know, he, mayor's up there too. Right now it's $4,000. It's going up to $8,000 in Lewiston. Um, looking at my math, at 700 and, I'm sorry, I just did this. I just want to give you some examples so you can noodle around. It's uncomfortable for me to talk about my own compensation, by the way, too. But I'm thinking about the future mayor next term, the term after, the term after. Um, and I talked to the past mayor, Mayor Labonte, about this as well. I'll get to that. Average median salary is $17.36 per hour. Taking away all the extra, you're looking at the mayor should spend, should at a minimum spend 750 hours annually. 
that would work out to being over $14,000 in compensation um, at that average median hourly rate. I don't necessarily think that is where we need to go as a city, but I think that's what you're looking at. If you wanted someone in that position to put the time in, it would be fair. And I will say this, it was interesting. I went to Athens in September, stared at the Acropolis and you know, just got my history fix in. And before that, I went to the House of Burgesses in Williamsburg, visit some family. And I did the tour, and that was pretty awesome, Colonial Williamsburg. And they both said the same thing in history, because Virginia, our initial government, still true today, was based upon ancient Greece and ancient Rome. That citizens had a duty to serve. And I've heard that all the time. We do. We have a duty to serve. But we always put a period there. What we don't do is we don't actually include the initial comma and the rest of the statement. All citizens have a duty to serve, comma, who are white, male, wealthy landowners. Because you had a duty to serve because you could afford to serve, and it was your duty to sacrifice your time because you could afford to back to the community. Fair enough. That's how it was then. Not going to take anything away from that. It's really, really difficult today in today's day and age if you want a mayor or a council or a school committee to do all these different meetings throughout and not compensate them at least a little bit and acknowledge that we just don't want rich old white guys to be serving in government. A couple of things. One, I think again to Lucent has gone through this process and they have pegged a certain amount. Mm -hmm. And for us to be much less is not appropriate, but us, for us to be much more is not appropriate either. I think another thing to consider about why people don't run, and I don't think it's so always because of the money, I think it has to do with people being feeling comfortable that they can run for office and they'll know enough about what they need to do, and I don't think we do a very good job either, most city councils, of creating a pipeline of people who are ready and excited to do this. So I would say peg it to the Lewiston one because they're comparable jobs, comparable cities, comparable responsibilities. But then also in terms of getting people to run, we need to think about that as a separate issue. Is there any other comment? Right now I got a proposal in this workshop to peg it to Lewiston for council, school committee, and mayor, correct? Okay. Councilor Gary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've served on this council for a long time off and on, non-consecutive, but all this time. I never considered the salary as a point to serve my constituents. I get a lot of joy in doing that. When I made a statement in front of our good city manager, I said the $1,800 we get is a stipend, and I use the money to go to outside events. And he said, well, Councilor Gary, we've got a fund, so if you want to go to different events, we can you know, pay you to go to that. If we raise our salary, where's that going to fall into this? Also, potentially, I'm not going to jinx this election, but there's a potential of four of us possibly coming back, and we're voting to put us at a raise if we come back next term. As much as I refuse to vote for me to get a raise, I may be more welcome, I mean, more wanting to vote for this if this was to skip the next current legis I mean, city council term and go for the next cycle. That way anybody will know what's going on and can decide whether they want to run or not. Because it's not, I mean, like I said, I didn't do, I'm not doing this for the money. So, oh, very good. Is there any other comments on that? Councilor yeah, McLeod? I was going to uh, echo what Councilor Gary was saying. I like the idea of increasing our <clears throat> the stipends, but I do think that we should go uh, one cycle off so it would not start in January. It would start two years from now. So here's what I'll say about this. You guys, this. I think you're a little bit too altruistic on the whole. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. this is, I think it actually but. helps the next council to have this taken care of now. For those of us who understand what service means, how much time it takes, so that we can vote from knowledge, whereas having the next council decide on it, especially if they're new, 
The other thing I'll say is that we each have different circumstances. I don't have to pay for child care to come to these meetings. If I did, that would be a big barrier for me. I don't have to pay for a cab to bring me here. If I did, that would be a big barrier for me. So when we talk about equity, I think we need to consider other people's circumstances, not just our own in terms of being able to do this. Yeah, and I, I think everybody would be great if everybody had an unlimited amount of time because this is the main thing in their life that they could devote to service. It's great. Um, some of us do, some of us don't. Uh, the vast majority of people don't, um, and that's the truth. You know, it's, and if you look historically back on who served on this body and other bodies, um, it becomes pretty clear. It really does. So right now I'm getting, I've got Councilor Rosani put that on the table. <coughs> Compensation for council, school committee, mayor, to mirror that of Lewiston. If I don't have, Mr. Manager? Mayor, I would just say that I think we would have to check the language. I believe the city council, the current city council, would adopt what the next term's compensation would be, not two terms out. Yeah. So I think we would have to look at that language because I don't believe the current council could do that. It's really the responsibility of the next council to set that term for the incoming term. So I'm getting, thank you very much for that. I'm getting pretty much consensus on that. Okay. Yeah, I would just say that if these incomes were much higher then I would feel like we needed to take another term so that we didn't immediately benefit. But quite frankly, this is still paltry given the amount of time and energy and effort. And it's about access and you know ensuring that people are able to participate. It's not about lining pockets. I mean, this is just not that much money for the amount of time that people put in. It's, it's yeah, and I will say, you brought up a great point about our expenses and four years as mayor i have i have submitted one reimbursement for airfare for convention of mayors in dc that's it why because i didn't want to <clears throat> submit my true reimbursement expenses for gas or anything else like that because i frankly didn't want them to be scrutinized i didn't want anyone to say well how come you went to breakfast three times at raleigh's last week because I had meetings with three different constituents at Raleigh's. Yeah, so I didn't want to have that. And I think that's a, a conscious decision that we have to understand that in a heightened political partisan fashion, anything you do comes under great scrutiny if someone wants it to. So um, just to put that in perspective, I think that's a big reason why people don't submit those reimbursements at this level. So, um, okay, so if that's good, then we're going to move on. we got a couple of little ones too. A, the regulatory board. Let me just... Uh, council committee assignments. If we're going to do uh, on par with Lewiston, do we want to just kind of scrap that? Do we want to scrap that portion? Okay. Um, we'll put that away. Health insurance. Do you want to make health insurance available to the mayor, the council, or school committee? No. Okay. Um, then planning board we talked about. Regulatory board. That's a regulatory board. It's the last one. This is a new board. Um, I don't think, Sue, so are they meeting consistently or is an ad needed basis? So it heads up to $25 per meeting versus an annual. Okay. Um, if it's anything like the ethics board, they've met once in two years or a year. Well, this is a merged board now. So your regulatory board will be meeting um, as far for items from the assessing department um, and any other regular regulatory uh, functions within the city. So it is a little blend. I think we'll see more meetings with this group, but I don't think it'll be never going to be probably more than four or five uh, throughout the year. Any questions on this? None? Um, very good then. I think that's everybody's kind of in agreement, consensus on this on the regulatory board? Okay. One thing, if we could okay. look at what the overall economic impact is on these proposals. We can do that. So um, I just want to make sure I, I didn't miss this. You mentioned um, to fall in line with Lewiston's recommendations. For mayor, council, and school committee. But not planning board? No, planning board, we had, we, that came up after we already kind of settled planning board at 750. Plus right. 100. So now I'm saying is, now that you moved everybody else to Lewiston, do you want to do the same with planning board or keep it at 750? I'd like to see that amount 12. if we can. I think it's 1,200. Yeah, so I'd well, like to see that costed out. <coughs> planning board making the same amount as the Lewiston planning board. Do you have, uh, do we have consensus on that, folks? Right now we have on the table 750. Council Lasagna and Phil just talked about 1,200. That's planning board. I have nods, uh, enough nods? Okay. No, okay. What, what's not included in here is the chairs, uh, but I'll, I'll make sure that compensation is included in the total package. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think they'll be stabbing each other for an extra hundred dollars a year, but a little competition. Was that, a, that was chair of the planning board and school committee? They each of them have a or, stipend. Okay. Um, I, I, not the regulatory board, but planning and school. Gotcha. They do have stipends. And I care. I do. I think it's $25 a month for the current chair of the school committee, but I think that if we did something proportional to the increase, I think that would make sense. So if, you know, if that went up three times, the stipends would go up three times as well. Okay, is there any other comments on this? If not, we're going to move into the regular communication. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Manager, you good? All set. We got enough? Okay, very good then. Okay, we're going to move along to other communications. Oh, one second. Oh no, I have it right here, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to. Well, I can't pull it up on my, oh wait, here it is, very good, thank you. So uh, today, and this whole month actually, is extra mild day. Um, I have a proclamation here. I've, we have two winners, two award winners of this. Well, we're gonna notify them and hopefully they'll be here for the November, November 15th meeting, but I'm not gonna tell you who they are. So whereas Auburn, Maine is a community which acknowledges that a special vibrancy exists within the entire community when its individual citizens collectively go the extra mile in personal effort, volunteerism, and service. And whereas Auburn is a community with, which encourages its citizens to maximize their personal contribution to the community by giving of themselves wholeheartedly and with total effort, commitment, and conviction to their individual ambitions, family, friends, community, and Whereas, Auburn is a community which chooses to shine a light on and celebrate individuals and organizations within its community who go the extra mile in order to make a difference and lift up fellow members of their community. And whereas, the City of Auburn acknowledges the mission of Extra Mile America to create 550 extra, mi 550 extra mile cities in America and is proud to proclaim and support Extra Mile Day on November 1st, 2021. Now, therefore, I, Jason Levesque, Mayor of the City of Auburn, do hereby proclaim November 1, 2021, to be Extra Mile Day. I urge each individual in our community to take time on this day to not only go the extra mile in his or own life, but also to acknowledge all those who are inspirational in their efforts and commitment to make the organizations, families, community, country, or world a better place. So, Extra Mile Day. We do this every year. It's a nice program. Uh, one other communication, we have Veterans Days coming up. I would like to mention at, let me get the day, at 10 o'clock, November 11th, at Veterans Memorial Park, there'll be a, excuse me, 10.30, a ceremony uh, for the unveiling of the new Marine Corps Vietnam Veterans Memorial Stone. That will be unveiled there. I will be there. I encourage all of you, if you can, to attend. Again, November 11th. Following that, there'll be a grand opening for our new Staples store right on Union Street Bypass at noon on November 11th as well. Um, so very excited about that. It's coming along. Signage is out front. Um, also, there, I, do we have an update on the stones that we ordered and for our Veterans Park? A completion date? Not yet? Okay. So just a year ago, we, uh, we put some money together to, or allocated some money to add two additional stones down to the cemetery off Summer Street, where we have a small Veterans Memorial Park. We've had a Veterans Day celebration there before, or remembrance. Um, we looked at it, Rita and I worked on it with veterans groups to make sure we had the accurate conflict names and years on these stones that encompassed everybody, all veterans from Auburn. So those are in development. Um, hopefully we'll have a little ceremony we can put those up, probably be spring. So just wanted to let you know about that. Second, Sustainable Auburn. Um, I want to bring that up real quick. Sustainable Auburn. Got it. Oh. We have brochures now. If you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, you'll see that these brochures will be out there soon, but they do have signage. They're promoting this. Right now, we have nine people who have successfully completed their application process. That equates to $7,350 in money out of the 20, 250000 allocated already in the pockets of Auburn residents for efficiency program. This is getting a lot of traction all over the state. People are talking about this. 
Um, thank you, Liz, for creating this. This is fabulous. And remember, that was funded with ARPA funds as well. So speaking of ARPA funds, um, we did, we had a public comment uh, two weeks ago at the last meeting uh, from Auburn PD unions and Auburn Fire Department unions talking about hazard pay. We have received proposals from them. We're taking those proposals right now, putting those together, um, and then we're going to present that for your review as a council and ultimate approval or non-approval or modification during our November 15th meeting. So I'd like to thank the Auburn Police Department and Auburn Fire Department for putting those together for my request before November 1st. Much appreciated. That's how things need to work. As far as ARPA funds in general, the ad hoc committee has been meeting regularly on Mondays. We have a very good list, prioritized based upon effort, risk, reward, impact on individual, community, business, infrastructure, and nonprofit. Putting all that information together in a nice binder, we have organized it. Rita's been a huge assistance on this. She's going to further organize it, um, and we're going to have that um, out to you for our next meeting so we can review the top seven or nine uh, additional projects that are potentially up for funding. Um, so we're, we're making some pretty good movement on this. We hope you uh, like what we have. And again, if there's anything you want to see accelerated or that's not on the list and you want to bring that forth, this by no means usurps the council's prerogative of bringing forth um, initiatives for action. Okay? So that is it for communications for me. Is there anybody else in the council that has communication? Councilor Carrier? Just an information point that the disabled American veterans uh, do a fundraiser every year to help with the operations uh, of helping veterans locally. And they will be doing their fundraising at the Shaw's on Center Street on Friday and Saturday. Okay. Awesome. Anybody else? Councilor Lasagna? Uh, uh, two things. One question on this. Do you need to provide your Social Security number on this public <clears throat> document? Just curious. If you don't have to, maybe people should know that they have the choice that they not do that. Um, they do have to um, for CDBG uh, tracking purposes. Okay. But maybe they can do it in a less public way, perhaps, or something. I'm not sure. Yes, on the online application. Okay. Um, yeah. um, the second thing is um, I had asked for an update on any kind of diversity, equity, or inclusion work that has gone on. I feel that it has been backburnered. I've heard from a number of people who are concerned that it will become another checkbox and not be addressed um, in a sustained way throughout the city. I am planning on talking about that during the city manager's report. Thank you. <coughs> Any other communications? None? Okay. Mr. Manager? All set. Non-report? Okay, very good. Okay, second, or next, rather. We're going to go with our first open session of the night. Members of the public are invited to speak to the council on any issue directly related to city business, which is not on tonight's agenda. I uh, just ask the members of the community to come up to the podium. Um, give us your name, address, and limit your comments to three minutes. Is there anybody that would like to speak tonight? None being, we're going to bring it on. <laughs> Councilor Titus, for all time's sake. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Councilor. Um, moving on to unfinished business, we have ordinance 35 1018 amending Auburn's Code of Ordinances, Appendix A, fees and charges. This is a second reading. Do I have a motion? I still move to second. Councilor Geary, do I have a, a second? Boss. Councillor Boss, okay. Um, I'm going to open this up to the public for comment. Is there anybody that would like to comment on us waiving 40 to 50% of all permits, fees, and making business and home ownership easier in Auburn? No? Okay, I'll bring it back to the council. Yeah. Council, I'm going to ask for, uh, first of all, I'm going to thank Councillor Boss, Councillor McLeod for all their help on this, taking the, taking the reins with, with uh, Brian Wood, our assistant <laughs> city manager, with a red line. Uh, this is a great document. A lot of good adjustments were made. Is there anybody who would like to speak in opposition to these changes? None? Anybody who would like to speak in support? Yeah? Awesome. I'm I would, absolutely. I, I, I fully support that we've done this. There, again, there may be small tweaks that need to be made, but as you said, 40% of the stuff has been you know, redacted out, and that's definitely a great starting point to make it better and easier to do business. I'm sorry, but we're going to need a little clarity. Was that 50% or 40% reduction? Oh, overall. Uh 40% reduction in fees, but 50% in terms of combining and streamlining. Um, 
I, so I, I think we're going right. to just stick with that 50%. Oh, there you go. The conservative side. So 40 to 50%. 50%. 50%. Huh? Outstanding. Okay. <laughs> now, thank you, Councillor McLeod. 40 to 50% reduction. Any other comments? None? We'll ask for a vote at this point. Roll call. I have one, oh, quest oh, one clarifying question about the ordinance. The way it's yep. in here, there's stuff that we voted on for the first reading that yes. still so, seems to be in the ordinance. Uh, so I just wanted to, yes, just do a quick uh, rundown, if that's all right, of Go. a couple of the changes. Nope, that's fine. Um, so just to confirm that um, at our last, uh, or the first reading, um, the coin-operated uh, device fees uh, passed 5 one to have those eliminated. Um, the jukebox, motion picture, pool hall, roller skating rink, um, and pool hall for the kitchen uh, were voted for two to be eliminated. Um, and the council directed staff to look into um, the massage costs um, and relating that to t the tattoos. Um, and just to confirm, the uh, state does um, require a massage license, not for um, a particular establishment, but for um, an individual um, in line with uh, tattoo licensing. I think the difference, um, similar to tattoo, is a background check. Um, the city does do a background check uh, for both massage and tattoos. The state does not. Um, the state does do roving inspections for tattoo parlors um, in each individual room, making sure that they understand blood bearing pathogens and other uh, requirements, same uh, inspection uh, for massages. So um, that is, I believe, what council directed staff to take a look into. Um, so if there wanted to be a motion, um, that's information I think that would be needed. Do we need to make a motion to accept? Make a motion to accept the um, ordinance changes as written. Second. <laughs> I have a motion from Councilor Lozani to accept the changes as recommended from Mr. Wood. Do I have a second from Councilor Carrier? Is that Councilor Carrier on a second? Yes. Okay. All those in favor of accepting the motion to amend? Is that we're putting the fee back in? Yes. It just, everything that. What he just said. Yes. Right, he just well, said. I was trying Counselor to. Wood. Yeah. The fee is staying, not coming out. Most of them are coming out, but yes, that, that fee for the inspections and, and the tattoo. tattoo is staying. For the inspections, correct. Yeah. That's what the motion to amend is. This time. All those, I'm sorry, one more time. All those in favor of the motion to amend the order? All those opposed? Passes. Six one. Okay. Is there any other motions to amend or amendments? Anything else? Great catch. Very good. I'll ask for a roll call vote at this time. Councillor Milks. Yes. Councillor Carrier. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Councillor Boss. Yes. Councillor Gary. Yes. Councillor Lasagna. Yes. Councillor McLeod. Yes. Unanimous. Seven zero. <coughs> I'd just like to take a moment here, and, and this is, I mean, this is unheard of. People don't remove 40 to 50 percent of their permits and fees, period, anywhere, um, and we did. So that absolutely huge, and congratulations all for working on this and looking at this with an open mind. Staff, especially, it's hard to say no to dollars. It really is, but this is going to be, uh, it's going to be great for our city. Feels good to vote for less government. It does, it does. Okay, new business. We're moving on to new business at this time. We have ordinance 36-1101-2021. Um, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Could I uh, make a motion at this time? New business. You want to make a, do you want to make a motion to suspend? I want to suspend the business that we're right now and add an item. The new business, add the BAB motion for discussion by us council. I have a motion on the floor to suspend the rules and add the Build Auburn Back program, right? That's B -B, correct. That we workshopped earlier. Point of order, does that have to be two separate? Don't we have to vote to suspend the rules and then? Yeah, we're not supposed separately. to know what first. Sue, just clear, just, clarity doesn't happen often. Yeah. I guess I need clarification. Are you adding an item to be voted on tonight? Yes. That's yes. We have Councilor Walker. Yes. yes I, I would suspend the rules and then add, add the motion. The item. So right now I have a motion to suspend the rules. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Councilor Carrier. All those in favor of suspending the rules, please raise your hand. Okay, fails, 4-3. Okay. 
Next, we have Ordinance 36-1101-2021, amending Auburn's Code of Ordinances, Chapter 46, Street Names and Numbering. This is a public hearing and first reading. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Councilor McLeod, Councilor Buss, open this up to the public hearing. Does anybody in the public like to talk about street names, naming conventions? No? I'll bring it back to the council. Council, we had a great presentation last meeting about this. A lot of work. Thank you very much. Any further questions? None? I ask for a vote at this time then. Can I get a roll call vote? Councillor Milks? Yes. Councillor Carrier? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Councillor Boss? Yes. Councillor Gary? Yes. Councillor Lasagna? Yes. Councillor McLeod? Yes. Passes 7 0. <laughs> Next, we have Ordinance 37 1101 2021, amending Auburn's Code of Ordinances, General Assistance Maximums. This is a public hearing and first reading. So moved. Second. Second. Yeah, motion for Councillor Gary, second from Councillor Boss. <clears throat> Open this up to the public for hearing. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak on this matter? None bang, bring it back to the council. <laughs> council, this was uh, brought up. We had a demonstrate our uh, PowerPoint and a presentation upon this. Any questions? Pretty routine. Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, roll call, roll call, roll call. Okay. I was trying to give you a break, Sue, mm -hmm. but you're too quick for me. <laughs> Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor Carrier? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Councillor Boss? Yes. <laughs> Councillor Gary? Yes. Councillor Lasagna? Yes. Councillor McLeod? Yes. Passes 7 0. Uh, last open session of the night, I'll open this up. Anybody from the public like to speak about any business not on tonight's agenda? Please stand to the podium and present, give us your name and address. Limit your comments to three minutes. Is there anybody who would like to speak? None being, I'll bring this right back. Reports, um, Mayor, report. A lot of work going on right now with the MMA, Maine Municipal Association, and the Governor's Committee on Affordable Housing. The, the committee itself has a almost final recommendation of ordinances, not ordinances, I'm sorry, recommendations to present to the legislature. Um, I'm happy to report that we are pretty much have adopted all of them, especially with the FLU, um, that they're recommending other municipalities adopt, up to and including elimination of all income standards for any residential type building in any zone within the state. So that's gonna be an interesting one to watch to go through. So a lot of work there, got another meeting tomorrow on that one. That's really it for reports, we're kind of winding down for uh, post fall and getting ready to gear back up on the next session, other than tomorrow's voting day. So. Remember to go online, check and verify where you live, which ward you're in, and where you're to vote. Wards one and two will be down at Pettengill Park at the Auburn Community Senior Center. Wards three and four will be here at Auburn Hall. Wards five will be at the Boys and Girls Club of New Auburn, okay? Go on the website, make sure you understand, and just get out there and vote. 2,000 absentee ballots already, Sue? Right around 2,000. Right around 2,000, nice turnout. Let's try to bump that number up a bit, okay? Um, any other reports? Council? Anybody? Councilor Boss? I have an update from the library. There was a very successful Halloween event that took place on, let's see, Saturday in the children's room. There were about 350 people that participated, and at times the line was snaking out the door and into the parking lot, but lots of happy kiddos and happy parents. Um, so just kudos to everybody who came and participated in the tra uh, craft table and made enough slime to cover the Empire State Building is what I'm hearing. Um, and thanks to all the children's room staff and Marianne, the volunteer, for their excellent work in handling all the huge crowds. And thanks for people for coming out. Was Annie there as well? Annie was there? Okay. If you read the newspaper, you know who Annie is. So I'm mesmerized. Thank you. Um, uh, this is for um, the uh, Main Waste to Trash meeting that I went to. They had purchased equipment to do new metal recovery that was to be paid off in 36 months, and it was paid off in 31 months. Um, their revenues are up 18% from last year because of that. Hmm. Any other reports? Councilor Milks? Yes, uh, the Auburn Water and Sewer, uh, both budgets are in. Uh, proposed budgets, um, no rate increase on either side. Um, on the water side, water quality looks good. We're getting into the winter months, which always improves the, uh, the quality of the lake. So, and then um, to follow up with Councillor Walker, we are on 
on pace to be at two miles of pipe replacement this year. So, wasn't the goal before 1.5? I don't goal? know what the goal prior to it was, okay. but I believe that our goal now is two miles a year, and yeah. we're on pace. Very good. Thank you. Any other reports? Councilor Walker? Yeah. I, it's okay. I'll let you go oh. first. All right. The uh, United New Urban Association put on its Thanksgiving. I'm mean, <clears throat> sorry. It's a happy Halloween, trick-or-treat day. Saturday, we had 427 uh, people that came through collected candy. We probably had close to a thousand pounds of candy to give away. Uh, we had 11 pop-ups with people standing there giving out all different types of candy, candy bars, and a lot of other things. Uh, McDonald's was even part of our giveaway that day, and we wanted to make sure to say thank you to them and all of our other businesses in the New Auburn area that uh, was willing to give away candy and all of the above. The uh, age friendly, again this year we'll do a free Thanksgiving dinner, eat in at the Seniors Community Center on Thanksgiving Day, 12 o'clock to 1.30 will be serving time. We ask that you give a donation if you are capable of doing that, but you're welcome to come there, have a nice hot meal, Thanksgiving Day. It will be served to you, and then you will go sit at your table and eat and be happy. And I believe McDonald's is going to be there that day to give us uh, apple pies. I believe that's going to happen. So thank you. That's Gary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Our opera meeting, we had that before our workshop. And we discussed a lot of the different categories and the different proposed plans or things that we thought would be needed or would be great to enhance the quality of life of all our residents. One of those things that we had discussed was the mayor's BAB program. And we discussed why it got so kind Councilor of- Gary, this is for reports on committees. I mean, I'm I mean, on not, a committee. We're, we're not. Excuse we're not me. back into the debate. I just want to. I'm keep not around. debating. I'm just stating some stuff, and it is um, our committee. Yeah, very good then. Thank you kindly. So we dis discussed the merit of it, and then we went into workshop. As a good counselor, Walker and Carrier brought up the issue. At that discussion, it was said that we could revisit by maybe amending it and tighten up some of the loose areas. And that is why I didn't vote at tonight's meeting to support suspending the rules to bring this up for a vote because I, I think we need some thoughtful discussion. It's not because I'm not supporting small businesses or Auburn businesses. I'm sorry, but we have to have, we have to move on because this, this part of the meeting is not designed to justify any type of voter action. If we did that, the meetings would last till midnight and nothing would happen. So with all due respect, Councilor Gary, well, thank you very much for giving that report on that topic. Councilor Carrier? Just a reminder that the school board meeting is at 6 o'clock <clears throat> Wednesday here in the chambers. And on Thursday night at 5.30, the airport board meets in the council chamber across the way for those of you who'd like to attend. We're meeting in the council now, not at the airport? Uh, I thought we were having one more meeting here before we moved back out to the airport. Okay. No, and that's no, because no, no, no. we we are offering Zoom for those people that can't attend the meetings. And right now, the only place that we can do a Zoom meeting is across the hall. We don't have those facilities yet at the airport. Got it. Very good. Okay. Thank you. We have no executive session at this point. I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. Mr. So moved. Oh, Second. I'd like oh. to get my report. Oh, God. It's okay. Uh, we can't get back. <laughs> Too, late. Uh, <laughs> Too late. Too late. Too late. <laughs> now, of course, our gracious city manager. Make it quick. It went 8 o'clock. Right. <laughs> Make it quick. We're adjourned. You're going to go over the 8, I think. No, just a quick follow-up. <laughs> Councillor Lasagna did ask uh, for an update on the work that's being done. Um, as you all recall, the equity statement that was brought before the council was transferred back to the city manager to move as policy that has been moved as policy the um, currently in the community room you'll see that we do have um, a, a 
board that's up on the wall regarding equ an equity lens. That's been added to the community room as a focal point for boards and committees, as a reminder as they're moving items forward, as they're giving things consideration to consider that equity lens that we should be uh, implementing as we discuss uh, topics. I believe that even our conversations today regarding um, salaries for the council, that has been now worked into our conversations. I think that needs to continue. I think there are some formal ways that other communities are doing that and we should continue to explore that to ensure that that is being brought up during each discussion as we move forward. There's currently discussions with the Sewell Foundation. The funding has been provided uh, related to a community coordinator uh, in Lewiston and in the city of Auburn. Uh, that's still being um, reviewed. Um, that is being done through uh, Fatuma Hussein, and we have uh, we will be scheduling a meeting with her very soon as we start ramping that that up and moving that forward, and that will be brought back for the council. I'd say internally, steps that have taken place currently is related to HR policies and procedures. We will be uh, we will be doing a, a presentation at a future meeting to the council, but I can tell you that during per certain procedures. Application revamping based on the way that current process is done on applying for a position and certain questions that are being asked are being removed from our application process as a, a barrier potentially for someone to apply. Uh, the interviewing process is being revamped as best practices are being included in our interview interviewing process. And then also HR will be having um, a dashboard that will be available as far as the demographics of all our staff. So that is being regularly looked at and being considered as we begin the selection processes. Um, and then the last piece, I can't go into a lot of detail, but there's a di director meeting and learning session that's taking place Thursday. And that will be uh, very much a hands-on opportunity for our directors to get into the community and have a good understanding of some of the pieces we're talking about. I don't want to share more than that because our directors currently do not know. I know they're all watching this meeting, so I don't <laughs> want to uh, share more than that, but uh, that will be a great session for our directors to uh, get into the community and have a better understanding of some of these issues. Great. Anything else? That's I don't it. want to cut you short. It's okay. okay. Shortly after. 805. 805 is good. We'll take that. Uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? None. We now are adjourned.